So you wonder how Carlson wins? It's actually very simple. You see, Carlson is actually the mythological figure four. And when playing chess, he waves the hammer. You know, he hypnotizes the opponent with the hammer. And then in the key position, his opponents get dizzy and blunder the game away while hypnotized. Okay, actually, the real reason is a little bit different. And to see how Carlson won, we're going to see a game that he played against Lev Onironian in the New England Chess Classic on Chess 24 earlier this year. Aronian, realizing that Carlson is very strong in mainline openings, decided to play the London system with Bishop F4. So if you want to know how to beat the London system, well, this is the video for you guys as well. Do make sure to smash that like button so I know to make more videos like this one for you guys. With Bishop D6, well, we're creating a little bit of tension between the bishops. So if white were to take, then black says, Ah, I got you. I can now take back with the queen, and I develop my queen with the recapture. Uh, actually, CD6 is not bad either, just to build a nice little chunky pawn center where you're covering all of these squares at once. Always a fun little setup to have. And if they go bishop g3, then yeah, you can just go castles. I mean, you're kind of just laughing at this point after knight bd2. You can even play like c5, c3, queen c7. And there's plenty of going like knight bd7 and e5, or even just b6, bishop e7. I mean, it gives black very reliable equality. There's absolutely nothing for black to fear at this point. And it is lines like this that make people think that London is just a rubbish opening that, you know, you just play some random setup, they're going to like play A3, A3, blunder a pawn and you win the game. But no, the true London experts know that you actually are not afraid of double pawns. Double pawns are a strength in the London system. And so he plays a room knight BD2. And Aronian's idea is that if you go yum yums, then we take and white's got the double power on that E5 square. Beautiful outpost for the knight, not what we want as black. So, Carlson plays the move b6. I mean, it's more flexible to castle first, but I guess he says, you know what, I'm going to play b6 anyway. I'm not going to keep it a secret, because I'm just that confident that I know can show my ideas, and you still can't do anything about them. Aroni now played the move bishop g3, saying, well, I don't have to worry about that c5, queen c7 nastiness anymore. You had castles, bishop d3. And now, just out of interest, where would you develop your bishop in this position? Now, I bet that 99% of you said, oh, it's bishop to b7. But then another 99% of you said, oh, it's a trick question. Max wouldn't say, like, it has a question or a puzzle if it was bishop b7. No, 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 I'm smarter than that. No, I, I know what this coach is up to. And you came up with the move bishop to a6 without you trading off that bishop. So they can't go, like, 95, charge the pawns and mate you on h7. No, not going to happen when you haven't got a light square bishop on the board. To be fair, bishop b7 and plonking an on e4 is probably perfectly fine as well. Like, it's kind of a matter of taste. Now, if bishop a6 Aronian inside, it's not to play the move bishop a6. I mean, it does misplace the knight, but it's not that big of a deal. The knight can come back, and the loss of tempo is not going to kill you here. I mean, you do also have a nice bishop where they're pawns. That can be on the dark squares. They kind of miss the light square bishop a bit in that case. Well, I play the move rook c1. You know, trying to get that juicer structure with bishop d3, cd3 that I showed black getting. And Carlson says, you know what, I'm going to let you have it with bishop takes d3. When the reason he plays this is because he realizes, well, you're not going to keep those double pawns. I go c5 and, you know, I can always swap them off later. And it's the point where Carlson says, you know what, I realize that one key to beating a very strong chess player is just play solidly, just equalize, and let them kind of make mistakes, saying, I'm going to let them try to beat me and try to say... Yeah, I beat Magnus Carlsen. I'm the best chess player in the world this particular minute. So we get them that. We get them like excited thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to try and get an advantage. I'm going to try and beat Magnus. And then use their ambition against them. Like what happened with Brutus and Cassius in uh, the Caesar uh, Shakespearean play. Well, why couldn't just play Castles? Just played solid. You know, Black might play some waiting move like H6 saying, yeah, you got nothing. You know, your London is so harmless. I can play a waste to move H6 and still equalize. But instead we had to move Queen A4 and you know, trying to get something out of nothing. It sounds like Magnus Carlsen, but actually it's Aronian who's trying to do some of that Carlsen magic on Carlsen. Carlsen now plays the move Bishop E7. Might seem like a bit of a weird move to give up a tempo, but A, White has given up a tempo with the Bishop as well, so it's not all that bad. And B, you kind of want to go Queen D7 and swap off that Queen, but the problem is if you do it immediately, you're going to run into a little thing called a chess tactic with Queen takes D7 takes and yeah thanks for the bishop mate uh but instead of bishop e7 castles well now black is free to play queen d7 and i actually think that this ending after queen takes d7 and knight bd7 is already a little bit more pleasant for black practically because I mean, you've got a little bit more space 
even this bishop can kind of be harassed with a move like knight h5. And if you play a move like d takes c5, you are giving black the space advantage. You know, you can charge out pawn down to create some weaknesses. You never know, maybe we put the rook on the b file to pressure. It's equal, but it's more equal for black. You know, kind of like the you know, Roman emperors, they were the first one. Equals. Well, it's the same in chess as well, where we have equal, and then we have more equal, and then we have super equal, which is Anish Giri. In any case, the next move here was not d takes c5, but very sensible move, rook c2. Just trying to tee up some play down that C file. Now, if I was black, I want to try to create some imbalance because I'm like obsessed about trying to win from every single position. This is what happens when you play plays trying to rate points below you every single game in Australia. It kind of makes you very bloodthirsty. Like my mouth, see like the blood dripping out of my out of my teeth at the moment from my you know, eating some lovely chicken, uh, or I should say like some red meat. Uh, in any case, the game went night could have gone night H five, and you know we could. Get that imbalance, you know, get those Silman fans salivating in the mouth with the thought of doubling the pawns, getting them by the uh, bishop versus their knight. You know, just to excite real people up for playing for a win. But Cosm says, you know what? I am such a strong player. I don't need to create imbalances. And I can let them make the imbalances for me. I just play normal, healthy moves. Play like the happy moves, as Michael Adams would say. And well, when you're happy, you tend to play good chess, right? And also make sure to show your happiness by subscribing to the channel so that you can get more happy videos like this one. In any case, now that we are enjoying like the hippie happy movement, well, the move A5 was played. Also a very good move to grab some squares. You know, it's often a good thing like why you see grandmasters move those rook pawns in the middle game because it can help you to get some squares for your pieces sometimes. Well, why play move A4, like trying to just prevent anything like, no, stop this, stop that. But sometimes like when you're swatting at all the flies, like what happens is like you're so busy trying to swat those flies and mosquitoes and you end up like swatting ones that aren't even really there. And that's kind of what happened to Aronian at this point. Because now he's created a little weakness on this square. I would have gone for the move knight h5 and just got rid of this bishop. Because that's the only half decent piece in white's camp. And it's not like white's really threatening to go dc5. Because after takes, takes, well, we now see the damage that a4 is done. I mean, it's great when your opponent is making all the weakening moves for us. Like, we didn't even have to provoke him. We just go rook b8, we pile on the pressure and yeah, we're just laughing at this point. Uh, but the game saw knight b8 instead. Also a reasonable move, but you are giving white a chance to bail out with bishop b8 and, and try and sink a knight in the e5, which is a good square for the white knight in the London in general. But after you miss your chance, well, Carlson's not going to give you a second chance. So let's break this down into steps. Step one is Carlson's played solid opening, just trade off the bishops. Because when you trade off the bishops, it makes it very hard for your opponent to know what's going on. Because they can't just evaluate the position by comparing the bishops. And then after that, step two was to play a little move like just provocative, provoke a weakening. And then step three is exploit that weakening, jump the knight in the outpost and make the opponent feel stupid for having weakened their position so much. Now, is Aronian losing here? Far from it. But the position does get worse and worse from this point. After king to f1, I may I would have gone rook c3 to anticipate knight b4. But Carlson played rook fc8 anyway. Just make sure all those pieces are good squares. And after king e2, I'm getting really itchy right now. Like, I'm just itching to create some sort of imbalance in this position. Like, I'll think about it, it's the imbalances. Now, you don't want to play the move c takes d4 as black. Because if you play cd4, you're only going to rook a c1. And, yeah, that pin's kind of nasty. You know, the rook knight on c6 is threatened. And, yeah, that's bad news. Uh, you know, if d takes e3, we have rook takes c6. And, yeah, in that case, we would see that actually it'd be Aronian who is better after rook take b6. You, know, you grab the pawn back, you're going to pile on that weak pawn on a5. Amazing how things change just with one move, right? Well, instead, Carlson saw this coming, and he played the move knight d7. But I would have preferred either to play knight b4 and just gain the move on the rook, put the knight on the juicer on b4, or go knight to h5 and just pick off the bishop again, because it's not like white other piece are doing much here. But yeah, he went knight d7 instead, and well, it's still a good move. White still has a very passive position, and it's kind of hard to know what he should do. Like, let's say you try to transform the position with knight e5. Well, you still have a double pawn at the end of the day. And you know, but I can even play a move like f6, just rip it open. And after takes, you know, bishop takes. See, the bishop is very active. Knight b4 is already threatening to win some material by kicking the rook away. Your know, white's just very passive. Black's just going to do a little pawn roller on any side of the board he wants. And white's going to be sitting there waiting for the hammer, the force hammer to fall down on him. In any case, instead white played the move knight b3 and... Gee, this is a long game. Let's get through it faster. Knight b3. Black play move h5. Again, a typical grandmaster move. Grabbing some space in order to create some weaknesses to leave white feeling more and more cramped in the house. 
So White played h4, and then Carlsen played to move f6, again, putting the distance for making a knight look kind of silly on this square. And now dc5, I think, was a mistake. Actually, quite a big mistake. Because now, after bc5, we see that b files open. The knight is really badly placed on b3. I mean, the pressure on c5 might look all well and good, but without an extra minor piece to attack it, this is just going to keep it all perfectly safe. Black's got the perfect defense. The less valuable the defenders, the better they are in chess. So, in any case, the... It said DC5, like, I don't know, White should probably play, like, Rook C3 and, like, just shuffle back and hope he has a fortress. Not the most exciting way to play chess, but times the results are the most important factor, especially when you're playing for tens of thousands of dollars in cryptocurrency. Oh, wait, that's the FTX Crypto Cup. I'm getting my tournaments mixed up. In any case, D takes C5 was played. And then after D4, well, Carlson could have played the move to C4 here and, you know, just had the... Pressure against that b2 pawn, fixing that guy as a weakness. But he played knight b4 first. And after rook c3, yeah, you could still play c4 and still be, like, just probably winning. You know, knight b2, knight b6. And I mean, that bc, a4 pawn is a real sucker for trouble at this point. But said Carlson played king f7. And I'm not sure if that was necessarily the move he should have played here. Because now after dc5, what we see here is that if black does go gobbling the pawn on c5... Well, he has rook ac1, and you know, that pin is kind of annoying here. We're sort of tying up the knight, leaving black a little bit passive. Not really the sort of thing that you want. What you want is you want to have the freedom. You want to have the freedom to move your piece wherever you want at any time and not have to listen to your teacher and do all your homework every single day. Now, this is the way the cool kids play. They play to move e5, as Carlson did, shutting out the bishop, shutting out the knight, and saying, c5 pawn is small fry. I can get it back whenever I want to. You know, I'm just going to collect it when I please. Why play move knight fd2? A good move to try to get that bishop back into the game at some point. After the move king e6, why play move f4? Another good move to try to create some counterplay, rip open that center. Black played knight to c6, and well, here's where we see the magic of Magnus Carlsen. Step four of Carlsen's play. It's going to be a little bit of a show off move, like, yeah, I could have just won the game normally, but instead I'm going to play a pawn sacrifice, show my deep strategic understanding by sacking the pawn unnecessarily. Saying that your knight is stuck, your pawn is stuck, your bishop is stuck. Frankly, all the white pieces are stuck. I mean, it's like we're playing quicksand, not chess. So we have to move fe5. I think it's a move that black is very, very happy to see. Because you think about it, now that bishop has really come to life, you've cleared a beautiful square on f6 where you can jump into g4, jump into e4, do a little knight's pirouette, make the opponent sweat in that way. Uh, so I think if I was white, I would have played a move like knight f3 and you know tried to get this bishop doing something. It's a bit of a struggle, but maybe you can try to bring the rook this way and try to pile that pressure on d5. Maybe that was a better try than what happened in the game. After fe5, fe5. Why play knight f3? You know, he wants to try to go some knight f6, knight g5, or some cheap trick like this. But Carson just plays the rook to b8. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure why he chose the b rook, because the b rook, c rook is doing a good job of covering the c file, blocking the pawn. He should instead play this a rook, and I mean, if white goes rook d3... Well, I mean, e4 is running in a knight d4, so make sure you don't fall for that trick, guys. But instead of falling into a check, you've got rook b4. You know, you're hitting this guy, you're hitting this guy, you're going to hit this guy. And yeah, some of these guys are going to fall. Like, this is going to be a robbery, and we're going to get the white down on the floor very soon. In any case, the game saw rook c b8, and yeah, that could have given white some chances. You know, it could go rook d1, keep that pawn, and you know, suddenly the game is not so clear. But instead, you know, of course, it's a blitz game, or actually it was a rapid game. So, of course, there's going to be some mistakes. It's sort of part and parcel with fast chess. You know, it's like whoever makes the second last mistake is going to win. And it turned out the second last the last second was made by Carlsen. Well, after Rook B1, uh, Rook B1 turns out to be a decisive mistake, unfortunately. Can you guys see why? I did point out the move before. So, it's going to make sure to see who's really been paying attention and who's been sort of like, I don't know, uh, like playing Blitz and Bullet Chess while watching this video, hoping that just listening to a Grandmaster's voice will magically increase your rating 200 rating points. Well, it will, but only if you if you solve the Grandmaster puzzles. So, well done, guys, if you came up with the solution of Rook to B4. And I already kind of explained the reason why this move is so fantastic and why whoever plays it, you know, is just going to win the game. Well, what can White do? I mean, if you bring the Rook back to A1, we hit him from this angle, like Rook A, B8, and, well, if you go Rook A3... I mean, look at this Rook, like, I'm just laughing at, like, this Rook is... You know, trying to do a rover, but it's a bit too late. Like, if you want to play the rover, play like a4, rook a3, move one or two. Like, this is this is not the time to do it. You know, can even swing over, like slide the rook with rook g4. You know, attacking rook lift, pin the bishop, pin the pawn. 
And if king f2, I mean, you just go rook f8, and I mean, there's no good way to deal with the e4 and win a piece, and yeah, white is just completely gone at this point. So instead, we could either move knight bd2, d2. For some reason, I'm smelling like some fish cooking outside, and I guess that's maybe what uh, Karsinki as well, because we all know that Norwegians love their delicious salmon, you know, $120 a kilo, because best quality in the world. And, you know, it turns out the bike is indeed feasting tonight with the regaining the pawn, and still with more fish to fry, as it were. So white played move e4, and black could just take the pawn. I mean, it's a freebie at this point. But Carlson says, I don't need if you're a freebie, Euronian. I'm just going to push my pawn forward and say you have nothing. And it's true, you could play the second best move and still win, so congratulations. White played rook c4. Carlson, for some reason, decided not to take the rook. I guess he didn't want to allow some pressure against the e5 pawn. But I mean, it's all under control. I could go rook b8. You can go yum yums on c5, and I mean, black is, is going to win this ending, most likely. Unless, you know, you have the endgame technique of a fish. Uh, but the game saw rook a2 instead. And I guess still... Actually, this one is one where, yeah, like... It's not like... I pick, like, this game, like, how Carlson won, how Carlson won, and he makes, like, ten mistakes. I mean, the sort of thing, like... The one thing I remember with Magnus Carlson, like, he has an amazing ability to tell when he hasn't played very well, but still won the game anyway. It's like, after the game, he probably says, like... Oh, I played absolutely horribly. I made all sorts of blunders. Like, horrible game. I don't know how I won. Just very, very lucky. I mean, that's the key. Like, I mean, we're keen to being a top trader. You do have to be a bit modest and sort of realise your own sort of flaws. It reminds me of time, like, when Matt Wadley so... For example, like, he recently said, I couldn't have beaten, like, Caroline without God's help. You know, about that sort of humbleness, it's very hard to reach your very top in chess. You have to see your own weaknesses very clearly to be one of the best. So I guess that's one of the strengths of Carlson that, you know, he... Well, at this point, why could have saved the game... The way I could have saved is by playing knight to b3. And I do knight b3 is pretty simple. We go knight c1, and we win the rook. Thanks to the game, folks. And if black goes rook to b8 instead, trying to go for some knight bc1, rook b2 business. Well, black can now play to move knight fd4, and yeah, look at that. We That bishop, like, it was useless for the whole game. Like, this London bishop was so stupid, but now it comes back with a vengeance. Kind of like the... Spanish bishop, like, or the Italian bishop. But just sitting there, you know, doing nothing for 30 moves. And then, boom, it's suddenly supporting the checkmate. Kind of like that with a London as well in this case. So now if black goes ed4, you know, white goes, bishop takes b8. We capture the bishop and, you know, white can go knight c1 and go after the rook. Fortunately, you're not dead lost as black here. Because you do have knight e5 and you are able to rescue a rook from the prison. Or at least trade one prisoner for another. And that would be a real plus prisoner's dilemma. So anyway, it turns out that black is still saving himself. But yeah, you can basically survive as white if you play it correctly. You have to see this move as c6, which has the genius idea of meaning knight takes c6 with rook takes c6. And then winning a piece. I'm using the moves here, I just don't want to force you guys to visualize. You know, you put the big brain in into action here. Uh, but okay, you can also play d3 and yeah, position is so crazy I have no idea what's going on anymore. You know, King f2. Well, I guess, yeah, after king f2, you could have, like, knight to c4 and c7 be one crazy sequence where you took a million pieces black. But the opponent's queening, so it all counts for nothing. Which is probably why you'd go knight a6 instead and, you know, leave all these pieces hanging like a beginner. But after c7, yeah, white is the exchange up in this position. And although Carlson would probably hold a draw because he's Magnus Carlson, it's not a whole lot of fun from black's perspective. So yeah, knight b3, could have saved the game, Levon, and then in that case we would have been doing the video how to draw against Magnus Carlsen, and that sounds a lot better than how Carlsen managed to win against you. But yeah, after b3, unfortunately, rook b8, and I don't think Carlsen gives you another chance. I mean, you know, it's Carlsen already gave like five chances this game, I mean, I feel like a six would be asking a bit too much here. Well, the game ended king d1, you know, rook b5, just pick up the weak pawn on c5. I mean, if you look at that like, whole game, like, it's all been like tantalizing, me, like, like, just take the pawn away, like, just take it, it's a gift. You know, it's in your arms, you know. It's like, you're saying, like, oh, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Well, I say just take the gifts and take the Trojan horse for yourself. Uh, you know, like, to make sure, like, get rid of all the, the soldiers first. You know, you can use the Trojan horse later on for laughs. Anyway, the game instead saw the move rook bc1. And, yeah, rook c5, just take the free pawn. Finally, rook 1, c2, rook a1, just keep the rooks on. And cast side just to repeat, just for fun. Rook 1, c2, and, yeah, don't play rook c1, and then you're going to have a little freefold repetition and white's going to claim a draw and laugh at you. That's not something you want to have your opponents laughing at you in general. So rook a3, keep the pressure on the b3 pawn. We had knight g5, black played king to f6, saying it's just a check, nothing more, nothing less. Knight gf3, black played rook takes c4, and 
The reason I'm playing Rook C4 is we see this Rook is kind of getting in the way of these pieces. Like, these pieces kind of processing, like, oh, yeah, Rook, you get all of the, like, the good stuff. Like, you get all the opportunities and all that. But if we got rid of you out of the way, like, if we put the knife in your back, well, we would be the ones getting all the promotions and all the raises. So Rook says, yeah, I'll just trade and I don't want to be knifed in the back by my own comrades. This is a better way to go to the opponent's side. Knight C5, and yeah, now this is just, well, double trouble on E4 and B3. White play King C2, and now we see the principle of 5,000 weaknesses in play. Good after Rook A1, Black is going to somehow, by some miracle, swing the Rook to attack the pawn. I don't see how at the moment, but Carlson always manages to find a way. Uh, so after King B2, we had Rook H1, you know, eyeing up this weakness. After B4, and you know, B4 is kind of a desperation move, because if you do nothing, Black's going to play like Knight D3, Knight B4, and... Well, let's say, like, say, why play some dummy move, like, I don't know. It's even hard to find a dummy move at this point. But let's say he plays, like, not the move knight to h2 or something. Well, then there's a the move knight d3, and we kind of see it after knight c2. And knight cb4 that white has to sack the exchange to avoid mate. So, pretty bad for white. Uh, but instead, we have the move b4, trying to sort of desperately do something. But by this point, the game's over. Knight d3, king b3. And now for all the people who have had plus 10 in the game and somehow managed to lose, uh, this is for you guys. So king a4, king e6, king b5, yeah, let's get a touchdown. That's, uh, we're playing king in the hill chess here. Black played a4, realizing that, you know, if white does play king takes, that we can go rook a1, you know, king b3, knight a5 is the juicer, but if king b5, got a beautiful mate, rook a5, and it's totally unnecessary, but i got to show it to you guys once the opportunity presents itself. So king b6, bishop d8, and look, the king is about to get a touchdown. You know, it's only they were playing touch footy like in Australia. Like, it's what happened, like, I remember that time, like, you know, when I was coaching some kids in the past, I always like to compare chess to other sports. Well, I guess, like, if this was basketball, then, yeah, this is the slam dunk with, uh, you know, let me make the move. Like, the chess, like, whenever I'm about to make, like, you can see, like, it's not letting me make the move. Just let me make the move already. Ah, oh, so satisfying. I mean, you guys don't have feeling, you know, when you play on chess.com or on league chess, you make the checkmate move and it doesn't do the checkmate sound. It's like, oh, I hope he doesn't see it. Uh, in any case, the game saw rook takes c6. And yeah, you got two piece for a rook, but the a pawn is just going to queen. Rook c1. King b5, a3. Bishop b5. And you no, know, it's not a Carlson game without Carlson showing off that you can ignore all the threats and still win. So we had rook c5. King a4. Rook takes e5, winning two piece for the rook. And after a2, white resigned here, because after knight b3, otherwise that pawn is going to have a sex change in queen. Well, then there's knight takes, king takes e5. And yeah, you just go like takes d3, push and baby, and one of those pawns are going to queen and, and you win. So uh, yeah, that's how Castle managed to beat Aronian. If we break down the steps of the game, step one was basically neutralizing the London by trading off the bishops. Step two was letting the opponent make mistakes by provoking him a little bit. Step three was essentially bring the rooks in to attack their pawns and win them. Step four was somehow making mistakes and the opponent back into the game. And step five was the opponent not taking those opportunities to save the game because of being hypnotized by Force Hammer and then Castle Manx will somehow win anyway. So uh, yeah, make sure to comment below with what you guys learned from this video. I know I learned a lot recording it. And also make sure to leave a like, it helps boost the algorithm. And certainly consider subscribing for more Grandmaster Chess content, both the, you know, actual how to win at chess and the jokes that keep you playing chess because, you know, chess can't just be dry all the time, right? Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video.